Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be writing down the Monday, March 4th slate of college basketball DFS. This is the last big Monday slate of the season, and I know ESPN calls it Big Monday, but we've got a very small slate, which is a very intriguing slate. We've got two games with high totals, but believe it or not, they're the same exact total, and they're the same exact point spread margin as well. So um, not really uh, an early lean on which game to stack. Um, we've got no players on DraftKings over 8,000, and we've got very little value options with two teams or four teams that play a pretty short bench. So this is a very interesting slate, and we're going to break it all down here on this episode for you. We are going to look at both games and tell you what you can expect from each game from a DFS perspective, who you need to be targeting or not targeting for your DFS lineups here on this Monday slate. Now, this is the last week of the college basketball regular season, so this is really the last big Monday that we get. Um, but this week is going to be fast and furious because we've got college basketball content coming your way. We're going to have some golf content coming your way as well. The Arnold Palmer Invitational is this week. Week. Um, so it's going to be a busy week here on the podcast. So make sure that you are subscribed. Um, if you like what we do here on the podcast, please support the videos by hitting the like button. Uh, please support the audio by rating and reviewing. It really does help me out a ton. Um, and I promise you, like those do not fall on deaf ears. I really do appreciate it. Now, I will not be having a Tuesday episode for college basketball. I will be doing the golf show tomorrow night. So if you want my thoughts for the Tuesday slate, head on over to the Fantasy Corner Discord. I believe we have the best Discord in college basketball at the FS. There's a lot of good discussion, a lot of smart people in there, and it's where I'll be all day Tuesday. I won't have a show for the Tuesday slate, but I'll be in the Discord chopping it up, talking lineups, talking strategies, talking plays. So if you want my thoughts for the Tuesday slate, make sure you join the Discord. Link is in the description on YouTube as well as on the audio feed. All right, so I believe that does it for the introduction here. So um, let's go ahead and without further ado, let's dive into game number one, a showdown on Tobacco Road. All right, so let's dive into game number one of the evening. It is a matchup between Duke and the NC State Wolfpack. Ken Palm has this game projected to be 78-72 to in favor of Duke. And um, get used to hearing that because the other game has the exact same point total. Um, now, what's weird is that this is the first meeting between these two teams this season. And... I don't want to get started on this, but the way the ACC does their scheduling, to me, the four North Carolina schools, Wake Forest, Duke, North Carolina, and NC State, should play each other home and home every single year. If they can do it for Duke and Carolina, do it for NC State and Wake Forest as well, because those teams deserve to play home and homes. They just do. Um, if you're from North Carolina, which I am, these games matter to everybody around here. And so it's pretty big news for all NC State fans and Duke fans that these teams are playing tomorrow night, and they all wish that they could play another time this year. So anyway, last year there was a season split between these two teams and fairly similar cast of characters in those two games. NC State won 84 to 60 at their place, and then Duke won it 71 to 67 at Cameron Indoor. So you're looking at a high total between those two games of 144, and Ken Palm has this one projected to be 150. So um, you know, definitely a little bit ambitious in my opinion with that 150 point total. Now in those two games, Kyle Filipowski was pretty good. He had 11 and 14 as well as 14 and 8. Um, that's pretty solid. And to me, he's a guy that, like, with where he's priced on DraftKings, he's got legitimate 5x to 6x upside. You know, he had a 5x game against Virginia in a blowout where he only played 29 minutes and he was able to put up 40 fantasy points in those 29 minutes. And that's a team that plays at a super slow tempo and is generally a pretty good defensive team. So to me, Kyle Filipowski has a ton of upside. He hasn't been the best recently. But he's been over 30 fantasy points in his last four. He's been over 34 fantasy points in three of those last four. He seems to have finally righted the ship on the little slump that he was in. And this is a guy who earlier in the season was up in the 9K and 10K range on DraftKings. And so now you're getting him at 7,900. He is the highest priced player on the slate. But like I believe he's kind of worth it with, with what he's done lately and what he did last year against NC State. Now, Duke's big three guards we got to talk about, and that is Jared McCain, Jeremy Roach, and Tyrese Proctor. So with these three guards... You want to look at the last four games because that is when Tyrese Proctor returned from injury and they have all three played major minutes in the last four games. Now, what you'll begin to realize is that the pricing on these guys is a little bit weird. And in my opinion, FanDuel actually has the pricing a little bit better, a little more um, accurate to how I would have it rated between these three guards. Now, in those four games... These three guards, McCain, Roach, and Proctor, have combined for about 71.5 fantasy points per game. You divide that by three, that's about 23.8 fantasy points per player. On DraftKings, none of these players are below $6,000. 
years. So that pretty much, if you look at the three of them together, none of them are, would get to 4x if they all were to just evenly distribute their fancy points like it's communism, right? Now, in those four games, Jared McCain has actually been the worst, but yet he's the highest price on DraftKings. In these four games, he has only put up um, 21.5 fancy point average with one game over 4x value, and that was 28 fantasy points, it was barely over 4x value. He has not taken more than nine shots in any of those four games. Jeremy Roach averaged 24.9 fantasy points over those four games, but he had one game of 5x value where he put up 35 fantasy points against Louisville. The other three games were below 4x. Tyrese Proctor, um, actually averaged 24.8 in that four game span and he said three games of 4x value or more but no games of more than 5x value so pretty much between these three guards you can kind of interpret it yourself but from a pure fancy points perspective roach has been the best in terms of volume proctor has had the highest floor and most consistency and mccain has been the worst even though he is the highest price now, from a usage perspective, um, you know, this Duke team really spreads out the usage among their starting five, but Jeremy Roach has had two games in those four over 20% usage, and Proctor had one game over 20% usage, but that was his first game back from injury, and that was when he came off the bench. So it makes sense that he would have more usage because, you know, when he was in the game was when McCain and Roach were out of the game. So, to me, all the numbers point to Roach being the like the highest fantasy score amongst the four guards here in this game, given that he has the highest ceiling, given that he has the highest average number of shot attempts in, in the four games, given that he's had the highest average of fantasy points in those four games. So um, that's kind of how I would handicap it. But like I say this about DFS a lot, and especially true when it comes to small slates, sometimes a bad play in DFS becomes a good play when no one else plays them. So if everybody gets these numbers on Roach and Proctor pointing to being a better fantasy player than Jared McCain, then nobody's going to play Jared McCain at a highest or at higher price. And so maybe, just maybe, Jared McCain comes in at super low ownership and smashage. It's definitely a possibility. But if you look at the last four games, he really hasn't done that. So you're counting on something happening that really hasn't yet. Now, after these two, or after these three, excuse me, we've got to talk about Mark Mitchell, who has been a pretty consistent factor for Duke here down the stretch of the season. His usage in the last four games has been alternating 28%, 21%, 28%, 21%. And he averages 21% on the season. So he's been above his season average in the last four games. Now, if you look at his last four games, it's pretty obvious to tell where the 28% games came from. 35 fancy points against Louisville and 29 fancy points against Miami were both games where he had 28% usage. And the other two games, where he was well under 4x value or when he had 21% usage. So to me, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. I mean, maybe you could make the argument that Miami and Louisville play smaller lineups, and so maybe against a smaller lineup team, he was able to have a big game. But Virginia plays a smaller lineup as well, but he didn't have a big game against them. So um, I don't really know what the rhyme or reason is for Mitchell's usage or fantasy production, but just know that the spike potential is there, and it's $6,700. He definitely has to make your player pool here on this small slate. Next up, Caleb Foster has not played in either of the last two games. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with him in this one. Um, I would probably not be a big fan in DFS if he plays. I think he's a little overpriced for what he's been doing lately. But if Caleb Foster does not play, the starters are going to see huge minutes. We've seen that in each of the last two games. But Sean Stewart has also been the number one option off the bench. He would be the slate's best and most popular value play if we get news that Caleb Foster is out. In the last two games, Sean Stewart has put up 22 and 21 fantasy points. And here's the best part. It has taken a, a combined 26 minutes to put up those 43 fantasy points. That is is an elite, elite rate, and if Kayla Foster is going to continue to be out and Stewart's going to continue to see those minutes, then I'm he's going to be on a lot of my lineups because that's pretty, pretty solid production. Ryan Young is the only other guy that really plays. Power has been getting a few minutes with... Um, you know, um, Kayla Foster being out, but it hasn't really turned into anything super relevant for production. Ryan Young would be a guy that would be kind of a foul trouble guy. If you think Mitchell or Phil Pasky gets in foul trouble, then Ryan Young will be a guy that you could go to as a pivot option. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about the NC State side. So uh, for NC State, I really like DJ Horn on DraftKings, and I really, really like him on FanDuel where he's super affordable. So DJ Horn is averaging 19 shot attempts in his last six games, and he's averaging a 27% usage rate over those six games. Now, 
in that stretch, he has had three games over 5x value and two games under 3x value. So to me, he is one of the best ceiling plays of the slates. He is either going to hit you a ceiling game and get you over 5x, or he's going to be an absolute dud. So in GPPs, you got to have him in your lineups for that ceiling. But for cash games, I'm probably avoiding him altogether entirely because of that volatility. But what you do know about DJ Horn is he's going to take a ton of shots and he's going to play a ton of minutes. So he's going to have a ton of opportunities to put up fantasy points and absolutely smash this slate. Now, Muhammad Diara, in my opinion, is a misprice in a bad way. Um, on DraftKings, that is. On FanDuel, he's much more appropriately priced. But on DraftKings, you know, he has had in his last five games two games of under 3x value and then um, two games of almost 5x value like it, it hasn't been exactly pretty in his last five and he doesn't take a lot of shots his usage in the last three games has been seven percent 18 percent and 12 percent so he's just not a big offensive factor for this nc state team what you would be reliant on is him getting a lot of rebounds in the last three games or in the last five games he hasn't had fewer than eight rebounds in a game and he's been playing heavy minutes since he's moved into the starting lineup but it's really hard for me to sell you on a guy who's sitting there almost at 7K on DraftKings and he just doesn't take a lot of shots. So um, for that reason, Mohamed Diar is mostly a pass for me. I think he would be an interesting game stacking option because since he is dependent on rebounds, more possessions would mean more rebounds. So if you're really thinking that this game gets up there in terms of a tempo, in terms of a point total, then he might be an option to consider for that. Next up, we have Jaden Taylor, who has come off the bench in the last three games. And when we talk about this NC State lineup, we've really got to look at what they have looked like in the last three games since they moved Jaden Taylor to the bench. His usage in those three games has been pretty solid, 15%, 30%, 22%. From a fantasy perspective, he's been at 25, 36, and 19. That means he's been over 4x value in two of those games and almost 6x value in one of them. So he does have a very legitimate upside. And to me, he's a guy where I think you can pair him with DJ Horn. I think you can play him as a pivot off of DJ Horn. Um, I think I don't think those two guys are necessarily correlated together, but a lot of Taylor's minutes are coming when Horn is out. Like the rare times that Horn sits are, you know, the times where Jaden Taylor is on the floor running the offense. So if you want to make sure that you get 40 minutes of a pure alpha in the NC State offense, you can play DJ Horn and Jaden Taylor together. Now, when we, we mentioned those three games, we got to talk about, you know, how – the rest of the lineup has looked. Michael or Casey Marcel is kind of just a three and D guy. Um, you know, he has had more shot attempts with Jaden Taylor coming off the bench. He's had nine, 15, and 10 um, with Jaden Taylor coming off the bench. It's only turned into one fantasy game over 4X value, though. Like with Mo Diara, I think he's a little overpriced, and I think he's more of a game stacking option from my perspective. Michael O'Connell has moved into the starting lineup in place of Jaden Taylor. He's averaging 24 minutes a game. He's averaging 15 fantasy points per game. He's averaging a 12% usage rate. So, um, you know, he does get you a lot of peripherals if he if he's able to stay out there on the floor quite a while. You know, the Boston College game, he did have 26 fantasy points, which is well over 6x value for his salary. So he does have a ceiling, but it's a very narrow pathway to getting there when you're not taking a lot of shots and you're not a very high usage player. So he's a value play that you can certainly consider, but I don't think he's the best one on the slate. Now we do have to talk about DJ Burns, AKA the dancing bear. Um, I love watching DJ Burns. I'm going to be sad when he's going to graduate from NC State. He is just a super unique player that they don't make much of in college basketball anymore, and I highly recommend you watch him before he graduates. Now, he was great against Duke last year. He would have averaged um, a little bit over 4.5x value at his salary, the where he's at right now. And he's a guy that he has been playing very erratic minute totals because he's kind of a liability defensively. But you can kind of hide him defensively against Duke. Um, you know, you can play him on Mark Mitchell, and it's not really going to kill you. You know, you can look at the Clemson game where they kind of hit him on Ian Shefflin or the Wake game where they kind of hit him on um, Andrew Carr and, and um, Matthew Marsh when he was in the game when Ethan Reed was in foul trouble. So in the games where he's not a defensive liability, he is a, a guy that can play a lot of minutes. And when he's out there, he gets a ton of usage because he's a really good passer out of the post and a really good scorer out of the post. So $5,800, I'm definitely going to be taking some shots on DJ Burns in GPPs. Now, Ben Middlebrooks and Dennis Parker are the two bench options you can consider. For Middlebrooks, he's kind of seeing increased minutes when DJ Burns can't hack it defensively. Um, so if you do think that DJ Burns is going to be played off the floor for his lack of defense, Middlebrooks would be a guy that you could play. Um, and then 
Dennis Parker was a starter for them earlier in the season, but they've jumbled up this starting lineup, and he's just not playing a whole lot anymore, but he's a freshman with a lot of upside that, you know, it's kind of officially a lost season for NC State now with them having back-to-back losses. So um, maybe you could see a few more minutes for the freshman. Maybe he might be a little bit of an upside play at an even 3K. All right, that does it for game number one. So let's take a quick breather and then let's talk about my Texas Longhorns. Now, before we dive into game number two, I do want to mention there are a few places where you can get more information from me. Um, first, you can follow me on Twitter. This is going to be super vital as we get into March because I'm going to have a lot of shows and a lot of content coming out fast and furious. And every announcement that I'm going to have is going to be made on Twitter as well as you know the actual content that comes out. So make sure you follow me. That way you can get any updates that you need. And if you ever had any lineup questions, just reach out to me. I'm more than happy to answer them if you reach out to me on Twitter. Also, we are going to be planning some live shows here in the month of March. So um, if you're following me on Twitter, if you are subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the audio feed, you'll be able to know when those live shows are. So that way you can tune in and be a part of it because I am going to be answering questions from chat and I would love to get a lot of you guys involved, um, you know, as opposed to just being me talking to myself for 30 to 45 minutes. So make sure you follow me on Twitter, make sure you subscribe to the channel and you can know when those live shows are going to drop. And I mentioned this at the top, but join the Fantasy Corner Discord. I think it's the best place to talk about college basketball at the FS with other people. And then also I do write an article on my Patreon for every single college basketball slate, as well as every PGA Tour golf tournament right now, where I profile my core plays, as well as my lineup strategy and attack strategy for the slate. I can't sit here and promise you that you're just going to win GPPs off of the guys that you know you can play, but I think you can get a lot of really good information that there's not a lot of people out there providing for college basketball. And I think it can help you um, build and perfect your process for building lineups and help you build winners in the long run in college basketball at the FS. Now, last thing, um, the state of North Carolina in particular, I know is affected by this, but sports books are becoming legal more and more um, in the United States. In North Carolina, it goes live March 11th. So if you were going to be registering for sports books, um, head on over to signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks. They'll have the best promo codes and offers available for any DFS player prop or sports book site. Um, so as those start becoming, um, I don't want to say legal, but as they start becoming available to you, um, head on over there, see what the promo codes are, see what the offers are before you register. I promise they got some good stuff over there. Link is in the description on audio as well as on YouTube. All right, so now we get to talk about my Texas Longhorns heading to the house that Chip and Joanna Gaines built, Baylor. Um, and so this one is going to be projected, according to Ken Palm, 78 to 72 in favor of Baylor for that identical 150 point total from the uh, earlier game. This is a rematch of a game that was played earlier this season where Texas won at the Moody Center 75 to 73 off of a last second layup from Tyrese Hunter, which was an absolutely thrilling game. Um, now, for Texas, in that first meeting, I'm just going to go down the line here in terms of fancy points. Max Asmus had 32.8, Dylan DeSue 30, Tyrese Hunter 27.8, Caden Shedrick 18, Dylan Mitchell 15, Kendall Weaver 5.8, Brock Cunningham 3, and then Ithiel Horton 2.3. So you can kind of see who was successful and who wasn't. And it kind of starts with the big three for Texas. And so Dylan DeSue only needed 24 minutes in that game against Baylor to put up 30 fancy points. He was 7 for 11 from the field on a 29% usage rate, and he dealt a little bit with that foul trouble in that game. So what's worth noting is that he was effective. He was used heavily on the offense, and he just didn't have enough minutes to get to the totals that we're used to seeing from Dylan DeSue. So I absolutely love him from a play. He generally plays 30 minutes in non-blowouts. So if you kind of extrapolate that out to this performance, he would kind of be at about 38 to 39 fantasy points if he were able to play a full minute load, which is absolutely a-okay with me at $7,700. He's taken 16 shots in each of the last two games, and he is a weapon in the pick and roll and pick and pop, and he will get you a lot of rebounds, can get you some assists and blocks as well. Love Dylan DeSue. I think he's one of the best all-around plays on the slate. Max Asmus, to me, I keep... I'm, I'm just flabbergasted at his price tag. He is being punished for his salary for three dud games against Houston, Kansas State, and Kansas. Now, the Kansas State one was a little bit weird, but like we're really going to downgrade a guy for performing poorly against Houston and Kansas? Like, come on now. Like, everybody performs poorly against them. So um, I think this is a really good bounce back spot for him. And the last two games have been kind of bounce backs, right? Like 26 and 28 fancy points. And he really hasn't done a whole lot in the peripheral stats in those two games. But basically, he's guaranteed double-digit shots. He's gotten that in every conference game except for one. Um, so 
you talk, you're talking about a guy who's guaranteed a lot of shots. He's one of the best scorers in the history of college basketball, and he's going up against a team who has been lit up by guards in the past and who he lit up in the first meeting for 32 fancy points. Yeah, sign me up for some Max A. Smith Monday night. Tyrese Hunter, I also like as well. So with Tyrese Hunter, there is nobody cheaper on this slate who plays more minutes than Tyrese Hunter. He is essentially a lock to play 32 plus minutes. He can really get up there in the peripheral stats as well. He's not a super high usage player, but he does have some ceiling games where he does score the ball quite a bit. And against Baylor, he was pretty close to a ceiling game. He had 21 points, 8 for 13 from the field, but was really under in his rebound and assist totals from what he normally sees. So I definitely could see there being a pathway to Tyrese Hunter having a lot of success in this game. I don't think you necessarily have to play a Smith or Hunter. I think you can pair them both together, especially if you are game stacking, because what they provide is a little bit different. A Smith is more of a pure score, whereas Hunter is really a pure floor general that is going to be reliant on getting peripheral stats in addition to scoring. Now, the reason why I went with those three first is because um, I got to talk about what Rodney Terry is doing with his rotation recently. So Rodney Terry, who has seen much criticism in his time as Texas head coach, and some of it has been warranted, but he's gotten this team back together playing its best basketball as we enter the month of March. And Part of the reason why is because he has said pretty much with his lineups now, okay, if I have DeSue, Asmus, and Hunter on the floor, I've got enough offense. The rest of my lineup is going to be whoever I can trust to go out there and bring the energy and bring it on the defensive end. And what that has led to has been big minutes for Kendall Weaver and Brock Cunningham. Kendall Weaver has played 19, 31, and 21 minutes in the last three games. In the last two games, he's put up 31 and 25 fantasy points. Big reason why? Because he's been out there on the floor more. And he's just a pure energy guy. He's an energizer bunny who is going to die for every loose ball. He's going to sky up for every rebound. And if you've ever seen a 6'4 guard get put back slams, Kendall Weaver is that type of guy. I like him as a play because I think that Rodney Terry is truly committed to giving him a lot of minutes. And I think the same thing about Brock Cunningham, right? He's a guy that he's been at Texas for like seven years years now and he generally doesn't play a ton of minutes or take a ton of shots but he doesn't need it to be super fancy relevant last two games 22 and 25 minutes which was more than he had dating back to the start of february and he had 26 and 22 fancy points in those two games because he was efficient from the floor he got you a lot of rebounds and he got a lot of assists as well well a lot relatively speaking so definitely two options that i think you can consider because rodney terry is committed to playing them on the defensive end now in terms of a pure matchup base though what that has led to has been less minutes for dylan mitchell now why i don't exactly know dylan mitchell is not a three-point shooter so maybe you know it's by playing weaver and cunningham you get a little bit more spacing than having dylan mitchell out there but in the first game against bay where he was needed he played 35 minutes only put up 15 fancy points though if you think that Texas is going to need to guard Jalen Bridges at the four, then Dylan Mitchell would probably be a guy that would need to play more minutes. But other than that, Rodney Terry seems totally content to just play Weaver and Cunningham all the minutes because of what they're providing defensively. Ithia Horton is, is a solid value play, in my opinion. He's sitting there at 3,900. He's played over 20 minutes in each of the last six games. He will shoot the three ball, so if he knocks a few down, he could easily give you a, a value performance there at 3,900. I think he is like the cheapest legitimate play on this slate where if you don't get any injury news, you're not trying to do something cute for foul trouble or anything. He's like the cheapest legitimate rotational player. Caden Shedrick, we have talked about also, he's a legitimate GPP play if you're fading Dylan DeSue. If you look at the minute totals, DeSue plus Shedrick generally adds to 40 because Shedrick is out there whenever DeSue is not, which is why he was able to play 16 minutes against Baylor the first time and put up 19 fantasy points because Dylan DeSue was dealing with foul trouble. And I actually think this is a super hot take here. I think you can play them both together. They've combined for 50 fantasy points together in each of the last two games. Um, so I do think that you can play DeSue and Shedrick together and just hope that Texas dominates the inside. I think you can, you can play DeSue or I think you could play just Shedrick. Um, if you think that Dassault gets in foul trouble, that's a nice little leverage play. Now let's head to the Baylor side. So Baylor in the previous meeting was a little bit weird in terms of their production. Jacoby Walter had 37.8, Jalen Bridges 25.3, Ray J. Dennis 14.3, Jaden Nunn 25.8. I had him a little bit out of order, but that was second on the team. And then Josh Ojanwuna in 
2.8 fantasy points in 19 minutes. And y'all, the bigs for me for Baylor, like they're close to cross offs. You know, Ives Misi with 11 and 21 minutes, he dealt with foul trouble. Ojin Wuna with 2.8 in 19 minutes, just not a part of the offense. And they're going up against Dylan DeSue and Caden Shedrick. This is a bad matchup for the two of them. I don't think either of the two of them are well equipped to guard Dylan DeSue and Caden Shedrick. Um, I, I think they're just largely going to be passes for me, except in large field GPPs at a very small ownership for me. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the Baylor guards and such. So Texas generally does not surrender a high assist rate, which is, does not bode well for Ray J. Dennis, who has a 38% assist rate on the season, is generally pretty reliant on assists for his fantasy scoring. But what's real interesting is we mentioned that he had 14 fantasy points in that game against Texas. Well, he had eight assists. So 12 of those fantasy points came from assists, right? He only took two shots in that game, which was his low on the season. And I don't recall the exact reason why he only took two shots, but it hasn't happened since. And so if you think that he's able to continue being an outlier in terms of assist rate, but he's going to get more shots and more peripheral stats, I think he's definitely an option at 7,800. But objectively speaking, I would rather play doing the sewer Cal Filipowski at the same price. Now, next up. We got to talk about how this team has kind of done their usage lately. So Ray J. Dennis is the team leader in usage, but the last four games, he's been at 20, 33, 24, and 23. Langston Love has been out for that period of time, and they have been a very balanced scoring team in that period of time. To me, it makes a lot of sense that Jacoby Walter and Jaden Nunn were the two like best fantasy performers against Texas in um, that first game, Texas this year has struggled against big, physical, athletic wings that they have to guard. They don't really have a natural matchup for them. So um, it, to me, it totally makes sense that those two guys were the best plays. And Walter had a 26% usage rate in that first game, 23% on the season. So that's definitely a sign that this team felt comfortable going to him, and they had a lot of confidence in going to him. Jaden Nunn does not see as much usage as that. He only had 19% usage in that game against Texas but he only averages 18% on the season. So again, they felt that they saw something in those two guys in that first matchup, and they went to him. Now, in the last seven games, with Jaden Nunn being out, um, Walter and Nunn have both hit 4x value in four of those seven games, and they've hit it together twice out of those four games. So um, definitely, you can stack them together if you think this game just goes absolutely crazy. You can play just one of them, but I think for the most part, my Baylor exposure is going to be towards Walter or Nunn. Now, Jalen Bridges is the last guy that I am going to mention. Um, so he is playing a ton of minutes recently. He's been over 4x value in three of his last four games, and he's taken nine shots in his last five games. So he's getting more and more a part of this offense, and he's taken more and more three-pointers. So if he gets high from behind the arc, which he did against TCU, he can give you a big fancy performance like he did in that game with 34, like he did against Houston with 38. Against Texas the first time, he was five for nine from the field, but they were all three-pointers, and he put up 25 fancy points. So we would like to see more fancy points than that, but he didn't get any assist. He didn't do anything other than shoot threes. So maybe this could be a recipe for a ceiling game from Jacob Bridges. Now, what could throw all of this in, what could throw a wrench in all of this would be Langston Love playing. He has been deemed a game time decision. He had played against BYU and then earlier in February, um, but he really um, hasn't done a whole lot in those games. He did have ceiling games against UCF and TCU. Against Texas, he played a full 25 minutes. So, um, you know, with him playing 25 minutes in that game, you got to feel like more usage is going to go towards Walter and Nunn if they're able to get more of those Langston Love minutes in their favor. Now, if Langston Love does play, I don't have a whole lot of interest in him, but it certainly lessens my interest in Walter and Nunn. And Mira Little is the other rotational guard for Baylor, but he's not playing a whole lot of minutes at all. They're essentially just playing their starting five and then Ojen Wuna, whatever minutes Ives Misi doesn't, isn't able to hack. All right, so that does it for these two games, and that does it for the big Monday slate, Monday, March 4th. And so this is, you know, the last big Monday slate. This is the last week of the regular season in college basketball, but this is also the start of conference tournament season. So this is like the time of year where my wife will just come to me and be like, hey, why are you watching 
North Florida versus Stetson. And I have to say, like, hey, one of these teams is going to be in the NCAA tournament, and I need to know enough about them that when they make that tournament, whether or not I'm going to pick them in my bracket or who to put into my DFS lineups from these two teams. So I'm going to be watching a ton of college basketball this week, and, and I'm super excited for it. And we're going to have a ton of college basketball content coming your way. So if you like what you saw here in this episode, please make sure you hit the like button on YouTube, rate and review the audio, and subscribe to the channel. That way you can be with us for the rest of March Madness. In the words of John Rothstein, this this is March, and so I'm super excited to bring you guys all the college basketball content for the rest of the month. So if you subscribe, you'll be here with us for that. Reminder, if you do want more from me, you can follow me on Twitter, you can join the Fantasy Corner Discord, and you can get those articles available at the Patreon. Um, but other than that, y'all, that's pretty much all I got for this Monday. Reminder that I will probably not have a Tuesday episode. Um, so, well, I, I won't have a Tuesday episode. It's not a probably. So, if you want my thoughts on the Tuesday College Basketball DFS slate, make sure you join the Fantasy Corner Discord. I will have an article on the Patreon as well, so that is where you can get those thoughts. But other than that, I hope to be back Wednesday. I don't know what my schedule for the rest of the week is going to look like, so I hope to be back Wednesday, but I cannot guarantee that. But if you're subscribed, if you're following on Twitter, you'll know when those drop, and I'm really looking forward to hopefully having a live show sometime this weekend for either the Saturday or the Sunday slate. All right, so that does it for this episode, you guys. Um, so if you made it this far, um, hopefully I was able to give you guys some good information for building your big Monday lineups. Um, thank you guys for listening to this point. Best of luck to you on the Monday slate, and I will see you next time.